Greetings, welcome back to the Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel where today we're going to talk about a big sauce, okay? Every farmstead needs a big saw and in modern time the big saw is usually a chainsaw, okay? But chainsaws really only got good and handy and small enough to be efficient and practical for a homeowner in you know, you know the late 70s and 80s, okay? Before that, they were big, heavy behemoths that had almost no power, and nobody used it except for, you know, professional timber crews and log yards and such. They would use them. But the homeowner was going to have a good axe and one or two good buck saws. Okay, you can have one man or two man buck saws, depending on how the handle arrangement is set up. And some are set up so that they can be used either way. But these are very, very efficient tools. I've seen these compared to um, chainsaws in skilled hands. Um, yes, a modern chainsaw is faster than one of these old-fashioned crosscut saws, but not by as much as you think. When I was in my undergrad years, I participated in a lumberjack team and got to play with all these different tools a lot. And well-trained people on a two-person buck saw will get outraced by a chainsaw, but not by as much as you think. Usually, in equally skilled hands, the team with the one-man buck saw will have two cookies on the ground in about the same time that the, somebody with a chainsaw will have three, maybe th three cookies on the ground and maybe starting into their fourth cookie, okay? So the chainsaw is a third faster-ish, I would say. Assuming everything's equally sharp and the people are equally skilled. Yes, I know there's a lot of variables there. But the point is, don't sneer at these. These are very wonderful, very efficient tools that you should consider for your farmstead. Now, these all need restored and repaired, and we'll talk about use in that in, in future upcoming videos. What I want to do in this video is give you a few things to look at when you see one of these at a yard sale or antique shop to understand the tooth patterns, know what you're looking for, and picking out one that's going to be a good restorable saw for your farmstead. So if you're interested in that, come join and I'll set these up and we'll look at the teeth. Okay, before we talk about the teeth themselves, we need to very briefly discuss what a crosscut saw has to do. So if we want to cut a log, and I've got my teeny tiny marker here so that you can see it. Okay, so here's our log-ish shaped object, okay? Your growth rings would be around this way, okay? Right, growth rings. Now, as the tree grows, it's just building up a stack of bundled fibers, right? Almost like a broom bound really closely together. So the fibers are going the length of the log, okay? Just like that. So if we want to sever this across the grain, okay, we need to do two things. First, we need to cut through a section of those fibers, okay, and then we need to plow out the fibers that are in between those two cuts. Okay. And then after those are plowed out, then we can go down through another section, and then we can plow out that gap. We can go down another section, and we can plow out that gap. And eventually, we work our way through the, um, the lock. Okay? Now, to keep this from binding, you also have to have the teeth flare out a little bit. So if you look at the, the saw plate on edge, each tooth is going to go one that way, and then the next one is going to come behind going to flare that way, so that the tips of these teeth are a little bit proud of the side of the plate, which widens the gap that we need to remove material from, but allows the saw plate to penetrate down into the groove that we're cutting without binding out. Okay? In wet wood, this gap needs to be wider. In dry wood, it can be a lot narrower because it won't bind as much. Those are all principles that you need to understand as we talk about the saws and how the teeth are designed. So this is the first and oldest type of sawtooth that I'm going to talk about here. 
And this type of tooth isn't just something that goes back to the 17 and 1800s. This goes back in ancient antiquity to the beginning of the Iron Age itself. Right? You can find this in Rome, you can find this Viking Age, you can find this older than Roman Viking Age. Okay? And it's just simply a triangle, triangular file used to cut teeth in. I mean, in these, the, these were certainly stamped with a fly press, but like ancient history I'm talking now. You just need a triangular file. As soon as you have a triangular file, you can make a saw. Okay? And you're just cutting teeth in with the triangular file. And then the teeth are going to be sharpened with the bevel on the top of one and then the bottom of the next and then the top of one and then the bottom of the next, okay? So this one cuts the top side of the groove and this one cuts the bottom side of the groove. And then for the set, this one is bent slightly toward the wall that it's cutting and this is bent slightly toward the wall that it's cutting, okay? So those two teeth cut the groove and then just the friction of the teeth moving in the groove that's been cut. So this will start the groove, this will start the other side of the wall, and then this one is starting to cut deeper, but the friction of it is pushing against what's already been cut. So that friction is what's going to plow the shavings out of the groove. And then the space in between the teeth is called the gullet, and that's where the dust is going to pile up. When the gullet fills, the saw stops cutting. Okay. So those are the concepts. You need your teeth to cut the groove. You need a mechanism to get the wood plowed out of the middle of it. You need enough gullet to accommodate all of that. And the longer the cut, the larger the log, and the longer the cut, the deeper the gullet needs to be. So having more tooth per inch isn't necessarily more aggressive. It allows for a longer cut because it has a deeper gullet. Okay. So that's the mechanics of this simple older saw. But the problem with it is that you don't have an efficient way of deliberately removing the material from in between the grooves cut by the teeth. And that's where we get to the next tooth design. Now this is not strictly modern, but it is newer than the first one. Okay. This is called a W-tooth or an M-tooth saw, where we have groupings of two teeth with a small gullet followed by a wider gullet. Okay? These go back to late medieval, early Renaissance Germany, is where this tooth style was invent invented. And what it's doing is it's taking a more direct approach at um, removing the waste from in between the cuts. So this, teeth, th this set of teeth, these two are sharpened on one side, in this case the bottom facing the paper, and then these two are sharpened on the top, same as with the other. But here we have two teeth that are going to be focused on cutting the groove with uh, a, a gentle approach, and then we have a deeper gullet in between them with a more aggressive, closer to 90 degree tooth angle. Now this has been improperly sharpened and needs a lot of restoration work. Okay. This, the first one, is pretty much new. That hasn't been sharpened more than a time or two and it's been sharpened well. It's rustier than this first one, but the teeth need less overall repair. This one is a much cleaner saw plate, but it's been sharpened terribly, so the teeth need a lot of repair. Okay, those are the things you want to look at when buying a saw. So we have a gentle approach in between the two teeth and then a really harsh, um, closer to 90 approach in between adjacent to the gullet. So that way these gaps act more like a chisel to forcibly remove the chip in between these two cuts. Okay. So that is a medieval advancement on sawtooth. But then later, now we're talking 17, 1800s, people said, well if this is sort of kind of like a chisel, why don't we actually literally put a chisel in there? So this is where you get our tooth and raker designs with that concept. Here we have two teeth to the raker. So this one is sharpened bevel down, that one is sharpened bevel up. So we cut the groove, cut the groove, and then this raker is a chisel, which is 90 degrees perfectly perpendicular to the groove, which then drives through 
picks up the chip and rolls it into the gullet. Okay? This is often called a Tuttle Tooth or a Champion Tooth, and there's a bunch of other names for these because in the 1800s there was a lot of competition and everybody was trying to gimmickify their saw teeth. But <laughs> really, it's two teeth to the raker. I don't care what you call it, it's two teeth to the raker. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cut the same way. These um, M2 saws, you'll see in pairs of two, pairs of three, or pairs of four. Okay. Um, so we cut, cut, remove the chip. Cut the groove, finish the groove, remove the chip. Cut the groove, finish the groove, remove the trip. Okay. So these are extremely efficient saws, especially in softer woods. The downside is that um, you can only remove a thickness of chip with the, the chisel that was cut by the first two teeth. So when you get into harder wood, if the tooth, if, if the, the raker is set too deep and trying to hog out too big a chip, okay, um, and these teeth don't cut down enough, the raker will just hang on the edge of the cut. And then it, it stops you dead in your tracks. You have to reset the saw and get going again. Okay, So they're much more efficient in softer woods but they can have a tendency to hang up in harder woods, okay? But they're much more efficient in softer woods. So again, move forward. You're talking about the you know expansion of you know industrialized culture into Western North America, where instead of cutting oaks and maples, they're cutting down you know almost entirely pines. You get your lance tooth saws which, again, there's a bunch of names for these, which are four tooth. Adjust this again. Okay. Four tooth to the raker. So this allows for a deeper cut. Okay. We can cut the groove here, cut the other side, take another depth out of the groove, another depth out of the other side, and then clear the chip. So, you know, you can see if we compare this and this, right, this gullet is a lot smaller than this gullet because this is expecting to remove twice the amount of shaving per pass because we're cutting the depth of the groove twice. And these are extraordinarily efficient in um, soft woods. So everything like tulip poplar, basswood, pine, and most of your conifers. These are not so great in hardwoods because again, Yes, we're cutting the groove deep, but now we're just exacerbating the previous problem where we're going to try and force the raker to remove more than is efficient and it's going to tend to hang up. Okay, So these are great for pine, but um, a little bit more difficult to work with on hardwoods. And this is the best condition saw of all of these. And you can see I've done a little bit of work and I actually am, this one is in use. Um, I could stand a little more polishing on the saw plate, but it's good enough that I needed a saw quick, so I put it to use. So, <laughs> you know, in pine, in pine. Um, these perforations in the teeth, this is so that as you, as the teeth wear down, one of the drawbacks of this style is once the teeth are, all, are sharpened all the way to the base of the plate, it's done. Okay, you can't really recut these teeth whereas the more primitive teeth, the M tooth and the regular tooth saws, those you can just file all the way until you run out of saw plate. These, when you run out of tooth, you just, you're done. You have to buy a new saw. So, you know, the older models with just the lance tooth, the saw plate would be where my hand is because you can only make these, these cutting teeth so long before they get fragile and start to break. And then people said, oh, if we make them longer and we cut longer rakers here, will extend the life of the saw but to keep them less frat, to eliminate the fragility problem, they left webbing in these teeth. So as you sharpen through, the webbing goes away and then you end at the, the base of the plate. That's another thing you want to look at when you're looking at purchasing one of these used is how much tooth is available to use. So if it's one of these um, perforated lance tooth designs, and the webbing has already been filed through, you've already used up three quarters of the, the use life of the saw. 
Okay. Now the saw plate can still be used for other purposes, make other saws out of it, make scrapers out of it. There, it's not junk material, but it only has so much more use as a crosscut saw. Whereas you know the older styles, you can sharpen, you know, not infinitely, but all the way back to the base of the saw plate. So that is another thing to look at. So thinking this through, if you're looking for these sorts of saws, there's a reason I have all four styles and I've gone out of my way to try and find all four styles. Um, this M tooth is kind of the rarest and hardest to find where I live. Um, so this is the one that I only have one of and I've only ever found one of at a you know, random junk shop. But these two, I'm going to be sharpening and setting for hardwoods. So the M tooth is the fastest cut uh, of, of the two. And I'm gonna set this one for working in wet hardwoods. So wet wood, remember you have more set and dry wood, you have less set, okay? And then this is the least likely to hang up in hardwoods. So I'm gonna set it for dry hardwoods. Okay, and then when I look at these two, our Tuttle Tooth and our Lance Tooth design, same sort of idea. This uh, uh, Tuttle or Champion Tooth is the most common to see in the area where I hunt for tools, okay? Because um, it's a really good compromise, right? It's a really good compromise design, really efficient, okay? So I'm gonna set this one for dry, soft, and medium woods, okay? And I'm going to set this one and reserve it for wet softwoods. So there is a reason to have all four of these. And the restoration of these saws, such as they need it, some need a lot, some really just, this one doesn't need any, just a little, little more sanding, de-rusting right on the edge. Um, but I need to remake a couple of these handles and really polish off some, and this one is in terrible shape and we can talk about reforming teeth. So we will do this in future projects. So I hope this gave you a little bit to think about and a little help with identifying these saws and kind of knowing what their purposes are. Um, which one is right for you? That depends on what you're doing, okay? If you are in the West Coast and you're really only gonna be looking at softwood work, the softwoods where you would need a saw of this size, right? You don't, clearly I'm not cutting dovetails with these, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you're cutting logs with these. So if you're only gonna be looking at um, primarily conifers and your softer hardwoods, you know, like some of your soft birches, soft maples, um, aspen, poplar, that sort of material, you only need these two, right? And these are the two you should have. This is your all around, all purpose for that sort of work. This is your lickety split, let's get her cut through on the really soft stuff, okay? Here in the east, where I'm as likely to be cutting rock, maple, or chestnut oak as I am aspen, there is genuine purpose in having some of these other styles. So it depends on you, what you're gonna be working with, what you're expecting to come up against, I just want you to have the, the, the intellectual fuel to know what you're looking at and to make good decisions when purchasing these sorts of saws. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you did and you wanted to give it a thumbs up, I would be most grateful because that helps the YouTube algorithm know that you liked it, show it to others. And if you're so inclined, you can go check out our Patreon page where we're building a big repository of useful information for this sort of craft and work. Either way, I'll see you next time here at Old Ways Rising Farm.